a time with us for this special discourse on joyful chaos in the tropics. Uh, so this uh, discourse is jointly organized by the International Science Council, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, together with the Mahade Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Um, so this is one of the pre-conference events leading up to the International Conference on Tropical Sciences, TropSci 2021. So for, for those of you who are asking, you know, why, why are we focusing on the, on the tropics? So the tropics is a resource-rich resource region. As a region, it accounts for 40% of the world's total surface area. It hosts nearly 95% of the world's mangrove forest and hosts approximately 80% of the world's biodiversity. 54% of the world's renewable water resources are also in the tropics and 82% of the world's living languages are spoken in the tropics. Uh, and by 2050, it is estimated that the region will host more than half of the world's population and two thirds of it will be children. And at the same, although at the same time, 85% of the poorest people live in the tropics. So while tropical nations have made significant progress, they do face a variety of challenges that demand focused attention across a range of development indicators and data in order to achieve a sustainable development. So to get things started for today, I'd like to invite uh, academician Dr. Mazlan Othman to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Sufyan. Greetings to all. Um, a very, very warm welcome to everyone and a particularly warm welcome, a particular warm welcome to Getan Siu. Um, Getan, um, uh, Getan Siu, first uh, came to our series of webinars uh, in a November uh, uh, webinar uh, to celebrate the International Day of Cities, which we called uh, the soul of the city. Now, during that time, you can find uh, the, the, the links to that uh, webinar. I think Sufyan can put it in the chat. Now, it, it was the first time uh, it was moderated by Mustafa Kamal, by the way, who's joined us today too. And it was the first time I had heard the term joyful chaos when describing one of the characteristics of a, a tropical city. And I thought, oh, what is chaos? Now, you know, as you know, uh, chaos denotes uncertainty and uneasiness. So what's so good about it, you know? But this immediately reminded me of a Nobel Foundation study where they had asked uh, their laureates um, a part, uh, you know, about their lives. And some of them indicated that their most productive, most creative parts of their life was when they were in transition when there was uh, some um, you know, uncertainty and turmoil, like for instance, when they were transitioning to a new country. And that was when they felt that they had the, you know, the, the most uh, productive uh, line of thinking that led to them winning the Nobel Prize. So really uh, what this means is that during this um, transition, or chaos, you know, there is discomfort and there may be a certain lawlessness and you can't see, you know, where you're going. Um, and so that leads to creativity and growth. And I can quite believe that. So joyful chaos then became quite um, intriguing to me. And I said to my team that we should learn more about this joyful chaos, especially as, you know, while we admire the beautiful uh, straight line cities of, uh, say, Copenhagen or Amsterdam, but, you know, I, I, th there is a lot of joy uh, in the tropical countries, not least the fact that it is warm, but, um, that's what I want to hear from more. I wanted to hear more from Gitan Siu, and that's why he is here uh, this evening. So he, I hope he will submerge us into all this joyful chaos of the cities he has been to throughout 
uh, his career. So let me hand this back to, so thank you Getan for being here. And thank you all of you um, for spending your Friday evening, your very precious Friday evening with us. I see Tansri Saleh no there. And uh, Dato uh, Ahmad Tase. These are some of the people I, I recognize, you know, the names. So welcome. And I'm going to hand you back to Sophia. Thank you very much uh, for the brief introduction. Um, so again, we are very thankful for everyone to join, uh, who are joining us, um, because today we, we have a, a smaller cohort. So this discourse is meant to be a more engaged session between the speaker and audience. Um, so a few housekeeping rules just before we get started. Um, we encourage that everyone uh, is muted. Uh, and then questions will be, uh, you can ask questions during the Q&A session. So there are two ways of asking questions. One, you can raise your hand uh, and then you could, we, uh, we will get, uh, ask you, get you to ask the question. The second way is that you can always type the questions in the chat uh, and then I will uh, convey, ask the questions to Gaitan. Um, and if, feel free to uh, turn on your videos or turn off your videos during the entire session. Um, this session is recorded um, and it, it is also live streamed on our Facebook page um, and all of the recordings of our previous webinars and also this session will be made available to everyone so you could access this uh, later. So we will now move on to the main session for today. Again, we are honored to have Dr. Gaten with us. Um, Dr. Gaten, so a bit of uh, background information on Dr. Gaten. Um, he was instrumental in setting up of the Mauritian Association of Architects. He's occupied numerous roles through the African Union of Architects before serving as the first vice, vice president and president of the International Union of Architects. His work expands across more than 1,500 projects in numerous countries across the continent. Uh, and you will see later in his presentation some of his uh, you know, photos and experiences that he is sharing. Through his foundation, the Global Creative Leadership Initiative, uh, Gaten also advocates for societal equity and poverty alleviation through urban innovation. So he is really a global citizen uh, and, and a great advocate for cities in the tropics. So without further ado, I would like to give, uh, invite Dr. Gaten to uh, begin his uh, presentation. Thank you, Sofian, and thank you, um... Dr. Maslan, I think when 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 Dr. Maslan uh, uh, coined this joyful chaos, it was a spontaneous comment, and then, uh, but she made me uh, think think more about everything, and uh, uh, I look back at you know all my travel. I begin to travel as an architect because I was invited to conference here and there in Africa in various places. And it's been 30 years of traveling now that um, brought me all around most about 100 countries, more than 500 cities. And being an architect, when you travel, you, you travel with in a different way because you can't forget you're an architect. And uh, if I take an example, taxi drivers, because of their profession, they have a vision of the city through their cars and they travel through the, through the city within a series of, of sequence and images in their mind and they know the city by heart. Architects travel in a different way. I think we, we are like birds flying over city and we see cities like maps and, and therefore, uh, we have a different view of, of what we see and, 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 and being a traveler, it's a bit a combination of a taxi driver and a bird uh, seeing the city two ways at the same time. And this is something I would like to share with you because <clears throat> it's, it's an experience that it's as if you're seeing things from very, a, a series of different angles and therefore your point of view always Will, will change. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one moment, uh, yes. So first, I would like to, to talk to about one city, Dushanbe. Dushanbe is, is a Persian word 
Tajik in Tajikistan, that Dushanbe is in Tajikistan. It's the capital city of Tajikistan. And Dushanbe is a Persian word. Tajik language is connected, is, is very close to the Persian language, means Monday. And Monday is, was just before the day of the market, crossroads that become a market, then a village, and finally a city. This city was built around a single uh, activity, a market. And this market later on grew until the Soviet times, which with the USSR, and then you have some sort of two vision that came to the city. One is spontaneous one with traditional knowledge. Most people that uh, are foreigners, when they ask what is Dushanbe, they will never know because it's a sort of an invisible layer of knowledge that are uh, shared only with the locals and those who know the city. And the city now has a top-down approach from, the, from Moscow, who do not know the whole history of the city. And the city is developed in a totally different way, I would say, because uh, uh, they want to build monuments suddenly. And these monuments create a different, different layer, a series of layer in the city, which are sort of foreign to the local culture, to the local structure. And it's, it, this example is quite similar to a number of cities across the world, especially in the emerging world. Wherever you have colonies of the French, uh, the British, the Spanish or the Portuguese, you have two cities in one, the spontaneous city and then the top-down approach city from uh, the, the, I would say, Mother London or Mother Paris or Mother Madrid or whatever. And, and this sort of celebration of uh, the original colonial city makes a second layer on the city, but this layer is visible sometimes, whereas the other layers are passive, invisible, informal to the naked eye and to the foreign eye. And so this is what we are, I would like to talk to you about. And this has a totally unstructured vision and uh, create uh, and uh, a city is really created with all these different layers. This picture is a wonderful French pastry, which is called millefeuille, which in French means a thousand layers, a thousand layers of goodies. And when archeologists come like centuries down the road, they excavate and they see different layers of history, time layers, daytime, nighttime, week time, market, uh, including the market day, of course, seasons, and all the time, these sort of layers keep changing. This, there are also function layers, which are also invisible. Work, live, celebrate, buy, sell, grow, produce. And of course, formal layers, visible layers, where we see space, streets, squares, neighborhoods. But the real layer that makes the soul of the city are the invisible layers, the, the layers of people, the layers of exchange. Some people live in a city, they never move from one area to another area. They spend their whole life in a street. Some will move and change residence. Some will live here and work there. And, and all these become part of the city which are unstructured, but it is really deep inside part of the city. I refer to this book, Probably you, you, some of you have read it, The God of Small Things, and, and it's written by an architect. Well, she's more an activist now than an architect, Arundhati Roy. And the story, chapter by chapter, is written in the same way by layers. Each character tells the same story through his own eyes and through the, his own experience. And at the end, the last chapter, when you read through all the layers and all the chapters, you get the full picture of what has happened. And this is exactly what, how cities are made, in, especially in spontaneous city, 
which is like a self-organization, a self-rule urbanism in the city. And cities are also made of, apparently, when we see it, we think it's disorganized. We think it's, it's in a form of geometry that is very difficult. One will lose its way through it. It's sort of complex, irregular, uh, and, and, and with courtyards where, like in Venice, which is a, a European and Western city, one can get lost. Lucky today we have Google map and, and, and GPS location. We can easily find our way out. But still, this when you compare Venice and the fractal layers of leaves of plants, you see there is some sort of natural, informal, topographical, sometimes mimetic to natural contours, to rivers, to different layers that structure the city. And this is what in the scientists scientist call fractal. When you look at a, a, a vegetable like uh, the cauliflower, you cut a small piece of the cauliflower, you see in, in fact a miniature cauliflower, which is multiplied by a thousand times to make the whole veg. And this is exactly the sort of repetition of geometry, which has its own logic its own logic of, of uh, uh, connections. They, they, they have their principles, whether in Dalavi, Mumbai, or Istanbul, or Naples, they use shortcuts. They use all-in-one functions, that is work, live, and play in, the, in all the, the old cities. All these functions is in one single location. And, and that how they come to be here, because the the occupants, they, they take the decision and choice to organize themselves in the way they would like to have land use efficiency, energy resources, uh, maximization, optimization of all available um, resources. And this is the governing principle that organize the city, but in an invisible way. Even in the construction of the city, you have a sharing wall principle, minimal inner circulation, the use of materials, what are available only, this is what they will use. And all these create scales, pedestrian path, low traffic roads, again, in a fractal way, like the tree diagram. And this is really with maximizing occupation and production of space. And today, with the COVID, the, the good friend, uh, which I, I will quote his name, Carlos Moreno, has sort of coined this new theory of the city, uh, the 15 minute city. Whereas in each area within a 15 minute walk, you can have everything you need, all the basic services, what a city would like. Paris, he's from Paris and he worked for the city of Paris. And Paris is actually, even if it is a, a Western city, organized into 20 arrondissements, which is like 20 villages. It's a collection of villages. Each village has its own mayor, its own organization and structure. But in each village, each quarter, you have efficiency, resilience, cultural facilities, and social proximity, and all the services, of course. It is very different from the, the image we have of uh, the negative connotation of dirt, disease, toxicity, toxicity, and danger, which are very often associated with that. And this leads me to the second aspect we would like to mention to you about these cities. They are made of connections. And connections and exchanges, all you will see begins with C connect city celebration, chaos, crisis, and now climate change, all of them are interconnected. And these connections are, is, a, is a symbol of, of today. Look at these numbers. When you look at these numbers, the big numbers, which are in millions or, or in billions, are all connections, roads, rails, internet, flights, pipelines, I haven't put maritime routes. I could have done that also. But borders 
things that separate us only 0.5 million of kilometers. So, and even now internet, which is the biggest number, connect us in an invis invisible way, it, virtually across all borders, more so now with the COVID, if you, if you think of it. And the world, the history of the world is made of mobility, is made of mobility like a perpetual motion, mobility for survival, mobility for a better life. People move for climate, for all sorts of reasons, climate, now we have climate refugees, war or work for a better life, for goods to trade, for good services, trading services, and exchange ideas, knowledge, uh, information, and capital without moving. And all this mobility is part of today's life. And this is what makes cities. You remember the caravans of Caravanserai and, and the Caravanserai were the first places to welcome these visitors and these people who, who move. Then we had cars, of course, which changed the city completely. But when people move, whether in the Western world or, or the rest of the world, they don't move for the same reasons. The girl from New York or in, in Europe walking a dog is something totally different and unknown when you walk in Asia or in, in Africa. People move for a reason and for uh, life, for survival. These girls from Davi are going to collect water. In the same, it's the same in Kibera, the suburbs of Nairobi, where the girls are, are given the task of fetching water for the, for the house. And suddenly they have been connected to water and this has changed completely their life the girls have been able to go to school and get an education. The whole life and one generation has changed. On the other hand, when you get the car and you see uh, Cairo, uh, if you want to cross a street in Cairo, it's like a nightmare. You, 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 it's impossible for us to, to, to do a simple act in, in everyday life. And internet in the most remote places are changing totally the way we connect and we move things or ideas in the people. For the, just for the, for the anecdote, eh, the left image in Kinshasa, this guy has found a new job. His job is to recharge all battery telephones for 200 francs, say $1, $1. His job, he, has, he can give you a new battery, a, a charge battery and you leave the old one with him and you come later and you, you collect your recharge one. And this is Africa. Now, people in Nairobi, of uh, the Kikuyu people are phoning with smartphones and they say in Africa, you have two phones, one to answer and one not to answer. And you, you decide who you give your numbers to. And all these invisible things brings you to these invisible connections. You have probably heard of this book or read it, The Invisible Cities of Calvino. One of the most difficult books I have read, I read it many times until I finally understood that, you know, Marco Polo is just telling stories to Kubilai Khan, the, the Mughal em emperor, and telling him of all the cities he has visited, but in fact, at the end, we learn that it has been the same city, but different stories about the same city, hidden cities, trading cities, cities and desire, cities and memory. And all these cities, all these fantastic places are really one and the same place. And I will read to you a travel note. I, I sometimes when a city is, is, is fascinates me and I, 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 I like to write some notes on, on this city just to remember the place because you, you forget a lot of things, the image that might convey. These are the notes I wrote on Khartoum, especially an area of Khartoum called Omdurman. The roads seem undefined with uncertain limits. We walk in dust, red dust, and the same dust has given all the the, the buildings around a, a familiar look. And my chauffeur gate, all dressed in totally white uniform, British colonial, walks me through the souk. 
and he negotiated in Arabic for me to buy scarves, etc. And he glides smoothly among the kebab sellers, the recycled babush, pita bread, or the pious men washing their feet before their prayer on a prayer mat in the middle of all this animation. The market women are selling their wares and hats between the scooter taxi. Street artisan advertise proudly their know-how. Plumbers walk with their pipes and, and taps like uh, spares on their shoulders. Electricians have light bulbs in his head turban. And all this animation is in a sort of an architecture, which is just a decor to the background. When you look up at this building, they are all covered with faded publicity. Some beautiful colonial heritage are abandoned to their past, and what remains are faces, black faces in white turban. The show is both inside and outside, and how can you forget a city like this? Khartoum, like all of them, smiles of happiness, colors, and extraordinary positive vibe that surprise and move all the travelers. So the, the cities, the African cities, but I believe a number of Asian cities also, express themselves by exchange, not the ones described in economic books, not only trade exchange, but exchange that are stronger than goods, words, desires, souvenir, and signs. And this language constitute invisible knowledge that cannot be seen, but can only be lived. And so this is really what uh, the cities today uh, in, in our language really connect all the people. And uh, for those who, of you who have seen uh, Wakanda, uh, the Black Panther, uh, the city of Wakanda, you, uh, you remember what the King Chala says, Fool, fools build uh, buyers where the wise build uh, bridges, connections. Eh? This is exactly what with the city is. And the other part of the city, which beyond layers and, and connection, is the question of innovation. Dr. Maslan just mentioned it. You know, chaos brings uneasiness, but it also allows a lot of opportunity for creativity and growth. In India, for example, they invented this word, jugad which is a form of innovation survival where it's more intuitive and less to do with data, but it creates the small essential in a livable city and a form of social uh, um, engagement. There are many examples in different cities when you travel. Cotonou, look at Cotonou and Hanoi. All of them have motor taxi. All of them are flooded you know, with with, with, with uh, all these scooters in, in Cotonou, they call them Zemijan. And now they are like Uber uh, driving in the city. You can uh, absolutely take anyone to go anywhere in the in place, but it's similar to Hanoi, which is a, a Vietnamese city. And in these areas, people are so inventive, you won't believe. I have been very often to Nairobi and I have a, a, a taxi driver called Alex. He is my taxi driver connected to WhatsApp. Before I arrive to Nairobi, I can connect with him. He's waiting for me at the airport and drive me during the whole week. And he now has a also good delivery service when he travels because he's connecting all his clients with WhatsApp. Another one in Abidjan, and like many uh, Asian or African cities, have the streets have no names and no numbers. So how do you find people? But with now GPS and go, Google uh, location, you can really move to city. So he, when you can ask for a food uh, delivery, uh, bring me a pizza or whatever, he said, don't move, I'm coming. And he delivers it. Now he has sold his app to a UPS, in, uh, which is an American company in Abidjan. So these people are really inventive and because of the problems of the city, they have invented new opportunities. In Kigali, which they have the first aerodrome in the world, which then uh, uh, have a fleet of drones to deliver 
medical uh, uh, drugs to, to remote places from, from, from Kigali, which is in Rwanda. But the most, the champion of all is really, this is a, a, uh, whether Brazzaville, Cotonou, or Khartoum, the invent, inventiveness of these people is in, incredible, how they find their way and they, they, they create new activity for their own life. But the champion I was saying is really Addis Abeba. Addis Abeba, if you go there, there is a place called the Mercato, uh, which is the market, but the market of recycled objects. It's a unique bazaar. I think all the Western gurus of zero waste must do a lifetime pilgrimage to this place to understand why, how they transform every single little piece of steel. Tons of steel, of plastic, of cotton, all kinds of materials are bought there every day and they are transformed. Transform in work of art, transform in everyday uh, object. Alas, not uh, copyrighted. Electric fans, uh, uh, sorry, um, oil jerry cans are turned into electric fans. Computer cables become wonderful, colorful, uh, basket. Wooden vintage calculators are made out of old telephone parts and so on. Every piece of material has a second life, like a reincarnation. And these are things that you can see in the whole of Addis Abeba in the Mercato. And this leads to this second thing, which means that probably the progress of these cities will not happen in the phase one, phase two industrialization, and then they move to service from primary, secondary, and tertiary, like we have seen the progress of uh, many cities. They will just leapfrog. You know, like in, in M-Pesa, in, in Kenya is the number one city, uh, number one country in the world who have invented the mobile money called M-Pesa. Why did that happen? Because 80% of the people don't have a bank account. They cannot uh, trade. So now with the smartphone, they can, you buy a bottle of water with M-Pesa in Nairobi and you can trade and exchange goods and money from a distance without the infrastructure, without building a road and anything. And let's now talk very, uh, succinctly on what I would say uh, really make these cities different. Because people, in fact, are the soul of these cities. Uh, Shakespeare said it a long time ago, what is a city but the people? It's true, people are soul of cities and people create identity. And, 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 and this is, uh, some elements are really, really uh, evident and when you travel in this city. This city, Kashgar, in Xinjiang, it's Western China, it's near the border to Kyrgyzstan. We, uh, my son and I travel along the Silk Road and this is one of the first Chinese city you enter when you come from the West. And Kashgar is a, is a like, I don't know, 1,000 year old city with an old city. It's a tale, I like to tell it, it's a tale of two cities. The old city is slowly, unfortunately, disappearing. And, and we have been witnessing the decline because it's being replaced by a new phase of development, top down again, design city from Beijing, all American car city, and this is being totally transforming the whole environment, losing in a way all this traditional knowledge and all this traditional, what we would have called chaotic uh, energy in, in, in this place. Unfortunately, this is being lost. During one month, we travel from Western China to, to Xi'an and the city is being transformed to become little Shanghai, most of them, one million uh, inhabitants per city, all of them same model uh, with the cars, huge uh, highways connecting the people and the chaotic order, which is, the, is being lost to the new geometrical, geometrical order. Luckily, luckily, there are elements that remain constant and food is one of them. 
food is also an element of comfort. And you, you know, I, I read food is celebration, food is comfort. Again, Moses. I asked myself, when you travel in most cities, anywhere in the world, any place, Africa, Asia, you go to the market, you go, you have uh, food streets, and the street food is always fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's incredible experience. This, I, I have this picture is a bowl of rice and some kimchi. Uh, there is a Korean writer called uh, Uk Cheng. He lives in Montreal, and then he writes in his book, you know, when he's homesick, what reminds him of home is this, a bowl of rice and some kimchi, very simple food. And suddenly he feels, he says, a man can live without a woman, but he cannot live without kimchi. And when you ask him, but where is the best kimchi you can get? It will always say at my mom's place. So can you imagine if we had only McDonald's, KFC, Starbucks, wherever you go in the world? How regrettable. Nothing can really beat mom's kitchen. And food, food is comfort, food is sharing, food is celebration. And the success of all these street food gives identity to all these cities. And this, whatever you do, even if you build new cities, totally new, you still have a food street somewhere that emerge. Even in Tokyo, which has been so highly developed, there are streets that are still dirty and, 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 and the Japanese wanted to remain dirty where you can eat your yakitori and sushi and enjoy uh, some uh, natural life, uh, human touch of the city. And it is also a place where wherever the city is, a place of celebration of colors. Whether you go to for the Holi in India, Holi festival in India, in Saint Louis, you see the fabric of Saint Louis in Senegal, Togo, Lomé, or wherever. And all in these cities, there is always a celebration of color, which are sort of universal. It's part of what humans want to see in the city. Even you see the mask of Venice, the mask of Lomé, all are, are celebration of colors and sometimes celebration of light. Hoi An in Vietnam celebrates light in lanterns with the launching, I don't know how they say it, uh, you, you sell, send the, the lanterns in, in the sky. And, and, and this tradition is everywhere in those cities, whatever you do to the city. It, ha it can develop into drones, uh, celebration or fireworks, and uh, uh, like Tokyo has been showing us in the Olympic Games, but it is still celebration of life. And the last point which sees to come back in the city is art. Before we used to have art for gods or art for kings and then art for money. And now art is for, by people, you, street art. Uh, Banksy, for example, is well known uh, for his street art in all over the world. And in, in all the places in the world, in Rio, even in California, or in, in, in so many places, art is and the graffiti ex give us the opportunity and the creativity of the local youth to create a new form of culturally creative city. But it's again, to replenish the soul. There, there is a last irony in the city because we have built so much and nature has been thrown away outside the city. Plants, insect, animal are out of the city. And suddenly we see in Singapore, for example, they are creating the same sort of disorder to enable people to reconnect with nature. And some cities even brand urban animals like Istanbul, we call the cat city, to bring a form of spirit, a form of, of nature within the ecosystem, which has disappeared in the Western approach way of the city. 
and this I, I I would like to conclude on on one city on on which which uh, you all know of course Le Corbusier and Chandigarh. This is a top down city uh, from French architect who decided in in uh, chaotic India in those days to build an organized city called Chandigarh. You all know. And then there is this. Uh, writer, Indian writer called Tarun Tejpal. He wrote a book called The Alchemy of Desire. It's a book on cities, passion, life, and energy. And funny enough, there is a, I read it in French, and the French title is Far from Sandigar, which it says it all. Can we, with our rational mind, create a city for the people? Or should people generate cities? So I think that the answer, the title of, of, of this city and Tarun Tejpal have analyzed it so well. Cities are layers for all the senses, textures, colors, shading, noise, aromas, and everything. And this is what people live and want cities to, to give them in return. And now a few words to end about this pandemic the COVID, what do we see? We see emptiness. All these cities, Tokyo, New York, Venice, Paris, empty, void, but not void of connections. We would say, uh, even some say it's the death of distance and, and the distances have created a new layer of connection has emerged, a layer of exchange, even this conference is connecting us in a way without the distance. Everything, trade, e online shopping, e-health, trade of goods, trade of, of services, all are being enhanced by a different layer of connections. Where is home, where is work? Frontiers are blurred. Some say home is where, or work is where the Wi-Fi is. Wi -Fi is. And, and some people are lost. They say Italians can no longer speak because they cannot speak with their hands uh, uh, online, but life must go on. House or no house, accommodation or no accommodation, and men, men must survive, government or no government. So will tomorrow be a hybrid of yesterday and tomorrow or just another layer connected to multiple layers? We are unsure about this, and or shall we just be saved by beauty? This city of Bukhara, some may know it in Uzbekistan, this wonderful architecture of a madrasa was paired by Genghis Khan. You know, Genghis Khan with his army invaded the whole of Central Asia, and each time he arrives, he burns everything to the ground. When he arrives in Bukhara, he sees this architecture and the beauty of it, he said no to his army, stop please save it. And, and, and Bukhara was saved by its beauty. So I will end here and, and thank you. I, 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 I am just an architect traveler talking to you and it has been an immense pleasure. In all my travels, I have learned a lot with, by meeting people. I've seen things by thousands of eyes, thousands of years because I was accompanied by people like you my global accomplice, partners of always. And I have been talking of things probably that some of you already know, but some may know of it without being aware of it. But for me, it has always been a pleasure of travel and learn through everywhere, every day, every person I've met and with your help. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Argetan, for that you know amazing, uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, session. Uh, I mean, I think having been, uh, having spent two years uh, in a, in a pandemic world, going through the photos, I think I've had like a you know crash course in traveling and you know, uh, like a like a thirty minute uh, visit around the world. And certainly, all of the photos and all of the points that you raised. Um, on the the uniqueness of those cities is very uh, you know very interesting. Um, so uh, before I go into the que questions in the chat, um, we we do have a, a few questions there. Um, so uh, 
so the first uh, question, uh, and feel free to, to those who pose the questions if you would like to also ask them, um, you know, um, personally as well, just raise your hand uh, and unmute yourself. Um, so, but um, I will ask perhaps from William. Um, so he, he was asking in the context of movements, you know, such as urban rewilding, um, and I think you you talked about it in your when you, when you showed the pictures of Singapore and Manaus, um, you know, bringing back nature into cities. Would you see the possibility of adding nature as the fifth layer to the model of cities? So you had your model of cities. Would would nature you know be be a possible evolution for those layers? Uh, you want me to answer that too? Yes, I think so because but. I don't think nature is like one layer additional to the city. Nature is part of the city. It has to be everywhere. And, and we are part of nature. It's, it's a sort of symbiosis between the city, the people, and, and the nature. And, and uh, uh, it has been a dream before of creating the garden city, Ebenezer Howard, probably some of you know of him. And, uh, but uh, this always looked like a sort of a geometrical addition to the city, which I think should be more natural and spontaneous. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we do have a few, we have a few questions uh, from Tansri Saleh. So perhaps if he would like to ask the que uh, questions uh, directly. Um, thank you. Um, well, I've answered a few questions there, Doc. Uh, let me first congratulate you on a very interesting talk. I'm a forester by profession, so I, I feel shy of living in cities. I'm more comfortable in the forest, as it were. So um, the first question is, can we limit the size of cities? I find the growth of cities has no limit. You know, yes. I mean, I, the second question, I started in Canberra and was amazed that these have traveled within the city because it is planned. And now they're trying to plan Putrajaya. And yet, I get lost in Putrajaya because the planning in Putrajaya, I don't think is quite as good as what Ton Mahadeva had planned it. You know, it's very confusing. I get lost every time I go there. Uh, thank God I have ways. But uh, the third question is, uh, you, I, I love street food. Uh, I enjoy street food. But most of the street foods, especially in India, I'm advised, don't drink the water, don't drink this, don't eat this, the street food. You'll end up in hospital or you die, diarrhea, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So I, I leave the three questions there, Doc, but uh, let me first, <laughs> let me once again congratulate you. I, I enjoyed the talk and um, your comparison to Singapore. I've been to that place in Singapore that you showed. It's amazing what you can do if you have a good, honest government. Fundamental <laughs> to me, in cities, you need integrity in managing the cities. And uh, oftentimes, the fault of uh, most cities going down the drain is a lack of integrity of those managing it. Uh, mm. Sorry if I sound a bit strong about that, but uh, <laughs> I, I do yes. feel it that way. Thank you. I think uh, that, that that's about the size of cities, yes. Uh, there have been a number of, sit of uh, studies made on that, and uh, the, the numbers. Um, some people do not converge or it, the, 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 the idea diverge, but there has been talks between 1 million to 5 million populations seem to be a sort of an optimum size of cities, but there are uh, different opinions on that because it's a matter of scale and, and what is um, the correct scale. I mentioned somehow, today the, the new concept of the 15 minute city that is the walkable city, which is another scale of the city. Should we have smaller villages within the same city? 
it's a different way of organizing the city. And I think now that with the COVID, we are thinking that this should be better than, than the old way. But there are different opinions. Camera and Putrajaya, yes, of course. But it's it's very Western way of organizing everything. And but what is I have been to Canberra or also to Putrajaya. And what I found for me uh, unfortunate is, is like it's so predictable. You know, I'm going to turn left and then this is what I'm going to see. And uh, you know, you stand in a street and you see the, the monument at the end of uh, 200 uh, meters away, etc. Everything is predictable. The, the sense of surprise, which makes a lot, uh, you know, when even a Western city like Venice or a small city like Florence or any small city in France or in many old, older cities in Europe, you get a sense of surprise, which makes everyday life enjoyable. And this you cannot plan. You cannot plan in the way we have been planning cities now. Of course, your last question on street food. Yeah, yes. It's the year of living dangerously. Eh? If you go to a <laughs> place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we are, you know, I, I remember we traveled to Chandigarh with my wife and from Delhi by bus. And we stopped somewhere, I, I don't even know where on the road, we stopped, it was late at night and it was too late to arrive to Chandigarh for dinner. So we stopped. And where he stopped, it was where the truck drivers stopped for the night to have to sleep and to have food. And we had food, chapatis there, you call it roti chanai and all this. It's so wonderful. And we ate wonderful food. It was so dark, we couldn't even see what we were eating. But, <laughs> but it was enjoyable. That's you we enjoyed it, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> we were not sick. So it's about, you know, it's part of the experience and you have to be prepared. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Um, any, uh, op open the floor to any uh, questions. Uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Um, if not, um, there, there is a question uh, from Vino Tene. Um, so do you think that gentrification can change the way the city or the characteristics of the city? Um, you know, so a lot of cities are undergoing gentrification. Yes. Yes, this, this is a big question. Eh? Um, it, there, it's a double-edged sword, you know, and sometimes you need gentrification to sort of upgrade a whole area and, and you need the investment, you need the improvement that they will bring and the, the level of service that they will bring to a neighborhood. But at the same time, you run the risk of losing the soul and the identity of the place. You know, uh, um, in Copenhagen, just there is a, a, an area called Christiansen, um, which was the place of the older hippies uh, in the 70s, 80s, or whatever. Uh, and then uh, this, they fought, they squatted the place and they, 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 they fought against government to be able to have a proper title deed and live there, etc. And gradually, this, this has been gentrified by a number of people when they grew older, they, they sort of negotiated the place and they sold to to newcomers, new residents. They are coming now. They are changing the whole, and, and the whole, the tourists visiting Copenhagen used to go to Christian, Christian Sand, I think it's called the, the area, to see how the people live there and to, to see a different city within the city. But now it's becoming Copenhagen the same. And, and so it's a danger. I think where is the limit? It's all a matter of balance and you need, you need to respect that and, and to change. Maybe one day, uh, I don't know. And you will lose a lot of things. Eh? You will lose a lot of things. It's, it's, it's a good, it's a difficult challenge, I would say. Um, so, so perhaps uh, I'd like to follow the, the, that up with a question. So you, you talk about, you know, balancing. Uh, so, so ensuring that you still have some identity yet modernizing and becoming more urban. 
from your experience, you know, how how do do cities balance that, making sure that you don't you don't just become one, not like you know any typical big city. Uh, this is a tough question. I think it's it's more linked with what uh, Mr. Saleh Mohammed was saying earlier. I, we, it's about the good governance of a city. Right? It's uh, it's it's all about that and a, a real a, a real balance between the way you manage city, you preserve its identity. Or not all areas of the city have the same function, the same identity. Very often the population is different. They have a history. Some cities even have streets, uh, trade, traders, some, uh, a specific trade like the fabric trade, textile is in one area and the food is another area. And the identity is given by all this. And how do you preserve all this in, in, in the whole uh, uh, city fabric? It's, it's a matter of balance and uh, it's a matter of management. It's, it's, it's quite complicated. I wouldn't say there is one rule for every city. It's, it's a case by case. Sofian, may I ask? Uh, Doc? Yes, go, go ahead. Doctor um, Gitten, uh, one of the most enjoyable places that I've been is in South America. You know why? Because of large avenues of trees and parks along the highways. The highways could be four or five lanes. And yet beside that, you have um, maybe 200 meters of parks um, that you can enjoy. And the people enjoy those parks every day, not just weekends. And the yes. essence is that it's planning. It is and, planning, of course. And, and, and why can't we do that in, in other cities? Yeah. <laughs> what, the second question, um, Dr. Gatton is that, what do you think of these skyscrapers? I hate them. <laughs> I, I truly do. I, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we try and claim the highest buildings, for what? The carbon footprint of all, all these buildings must be huge. And the amount of air conditioning, power, and all that uh, is way beyond uh, what is, um, in my term as sustainable and I, I wish people wouldn't build cities upwards build them laterally you know and include gardens in between like the cities in south america mm -hmm. thank you yeah well i think you know, the the issue of of latin american cities are, are very different some are, do have an old history and they have their old cities which were built before the car arrived, and therefore they have different street street configuration. Which uh, and and uh, they were small, and therefore, like nature was was outside. Those who were planned later have allowed large avenues. Uh, Buenos Aires, like that, they have really a large avenue. I forgot the name of the street, but but it, it's planned with. Boulevard of trees. Yes, and, boulevard. And boulevard. Yes. I was thinking of the term. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and 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 but but this is, I think it's all layers. History of layers. Eh? You, you, in the same city, you have the old city, the new city. In Paris, the center is is small, uh, but outside you do have skyscrapers. Except there is only one skyscraper in 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 the city, and everybody don't like it. <laughs> in the center <laughs> of the city, but it's like that. I think Dr. Maslan uh, yes. I wanted to add to that. You know, it's about you is uh, uh, planning versus you know an organic uh, to for a city to grow organically. Here I see I saw very contrast two contrasting cities in Brazil, the tropical of course. There is Brasilia totally it's supposed to be well planned and there's of course sao paulo there's um what's the other city rio. Uh, by the beach yeah rio you see nobody wants to live in brasilia because <laughs> it's so planned <laughs> and, and as uh Gaetan says you know everything is so predictable and uh, yeah, so, yeah so you need to have that balance 
balance between allowing things to happen exactly. um, organically, spontaneously, and then of course over planning something. Yes. I, I, I totally I'm, agree. I'm still going for the joyful chaos, <laughs> please. Thank you. <laughs> I totally agree because Brasilia is the new capital. It has yeah. been designed like Canberra. It was all the same generation of cities, hmm. you know, and it's the same. And San Paulo, Rio are, are sort of, there are a layer of spontaneity and yeah. therefore this is what makes the character. Yeah. But, it's not one against the other. You do have to plan, but but you have to preserve what is also the layer of unplanned. Hmm. We didn't even, we didn't cover very much the art and culture. Yes. So it's uh, it's in all that, as you said, that chaos, that yes. huge uh, diversity in culture will come about, and yes. that's what make it joyful. So, talking about art and culture, Mazlan. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one of the joys of going to cities in Europe is to visit the museums that they have there, the array of variety of museums. Unfortunately, in, in Malaysia, we don't have, we don't even have a natural history museum. I mean, and we are such a rich biodiversity country, okay, yet we don't have a natural history museum. Sally, you cannot shame. bring you cannot bring that issue here because get I know resolve that but, for but you. But what I'm saying to <laughs> Dr. Gaitan is that now, museums, to my mind, is part of the heart of the city. That's where tourists have come, they go and visit. That's history. That's where you learn the history of the country, et cetera, et cetera. And including the natural history, and the, the, the natural wonders of the, of the country. Yeah? One yes. of the things that I am I'm, I'm, I'm always concerned, uh, Dr. Sue, is this, when we go to cities, is safety, dangerous. I was in Nairobi one day, and I wanted to go and buy um, a toothpaste across the street, just 20 meters away. And the security guard told me, don't you dare go alone. <laughs> don't do that. So he had to escort me just 20, 50 meters away. Because why? I said, why? You can get killed going there alone, is it? And, and yeah, security really, uh, is, but security is an issue in many places, and uh, not only in, in Nairobi, you go in Johannesburg, you go in New York, you can also be yeah, married. That's true. <laughs> it's, it's part of also many things. I see one thing which, which uh, one question which uh, is interesting. Uh, can traditional old cities be transformed into smart cities? And, 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 and this is an interesting question because the answer is yes. Oh. The answer is yes, because smart cities is not about building new things or new square meters. It's about connecting the city to services right. and to new technology that will avoid constructing new things. And mm. this is, Barcelona is a wonderful example. It's an old city. It's hmm. one of the most connected and smartest city of Europe. Uh, in fact, it's the most advanced, you know, for example, just to give you an example of Barcelona, how they manage uh, all the, the municipality has connected all the waste collection drivers, trucks to uh, a smart app application, a smart app. Therefore they connect the, the bins are only connected when they are full and the, the lorries know which itinerary to use in the city oh. without creating congestion and traffic to collect only full bins, full waste bins, you know. So this is also, and the passengers also, they, they know what time to go to the bus, when is it coming, when uh, and the bus know how many people are waiting in the bus stop, the driver. So all these, the traffic, the security, the waste collection, everything is being managed smartly by, by, by new technology without changing and building new infrastructure. Okay, Sophia. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really glad that you uh, we segued into the smart cities, um, and I think we've we've come to the end of the session. But it's really good that you brought up smart cities because uh, this is I feel that this is an opportune time to also talk about the upcoming Tropsci conference, 
Um, as I mentioned earlier in the in my in my opening remarks, is that this is a pre-conference event that will lead up to that session. Um, so allow me to end uh, within the next two minutes just to share some a bit of information on the Tropside conference. Okay. Yes. Um, so the, as mentioned earlier in, in my remarks, that, the, that there is the uh, Tropside Conference 2021 happening from 25th to 27th October. Um, um, and there are, we are we're focusing on a few different uh, things such as tropical medicine, tropical agriculture, tropical natural resources, and also tropical architecture and engineering. Um, so um, we, we encourage everybody to, uh, to, 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 to view the website and also register. Um, because there will be a session on smart people first cities in the tropics. Um, so at the moment, we have three speakers who have tentatively, uh, who have agreed to be part of the session. Uh, Dr. Gayton is uh, one of the panelists and we are again very honored to have him there. Um, and we are looking to get uh, representatives from UN Habitat um, and also some, someone from uh, Indonesia to talk about the proposed um, uh, new new city for them. So um, we, we've come, we've come to it. We've come to the end of the session. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm really thankful for everyone who who's joined us today. Um, again, these sessions are recorded and are live streamed on Facebook. So feel free to share the videos um, with with your colleagues and networks. Um, and you can you can view the video after after this session as well. Um, thank you very much for, to Dr. Gayton for spending his time. Um, I, his, his presentation slides were amazing, and I'm sure a lot of time were, uh, you know, were, were, were put in into uh, preparing the slides. Thank you, everyone, who joined us uh, this, this evening, uh, spending your Friday evening with us.